Well, happy Eve of Christmas Eve, everybody. <laughs> Christmas Eve is tomorrow. It's already here. Christmas Eve is tomorrow, which makes Christmas on Tuesday. Wow. Now, we have three Christmas Eve services. Tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 6 o'clock. And if you're not out of town, if you are here, we would love it if you would come to one of those services at 2 or 4 or 6. They're all going to be identical candlelight services. And I'd love it if you came. Now, I want to tell you, if you're going to come, you might as well invite somebody with you, maybe a neighbor or a family member or a friend. A lot of people love to go to candlelight Christmas Eve services, they just don't know where one is, and so let's help them out. Maybe text them or whatever and let some people know and invite some people to be here with you. Now, the last two Christmas Eve services, the last two years, the Christmas Eve services have been very different, and the reason is because they were on the, in the weekend and they sort of took the place of of our regular services, and so I preached, and we took an offering, and all that sort of thing that we don't usually do. But now all that's done, and now we start back to the way it used to be. I'm not going to preach. We're not taking up an offering. We're coming, and we're just singing, and just having an opportunity to kind of to uh, tell Christ how much we love Him, and let the Lord know how grateful that we are and just enjoy the Christmas season together. There will be a special time for the kids and that sort of thing. So be sure and invite someone. The last two weekends on both campuses, this campus, Sugar Land, and then the Missouri City campus, we've had an event called Gifts of Love. And you guys remember that. You recognize that term. And what it is is that we we invite people that are really hurting and struggling, families that are really going through hard times, to come and sort of shop uh, for the parents to have uh, gifts for their kids and the kids for their parents. And uh, over the course of those two weekends in which we did that, we saw 264 families that are really down and out and struggling that we were able to bless with all these gifts that they can give to each other, and it was pretty cool. And in fact, it represents almost 1,200 people that we got the opportunity to touch in the gifts of love. Did you know that there were 689 volunteers from this church? I love this church. I love you. Thank you so much that you gave up your time to be a part of that. And in fact, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you were a volunteer for the Gifts of Love in either campus, would you stand right now? And we just want to say thank you to you. Look at these great people and the willingness to give themselves away. Thank you so much. Did you know that we had 114 individuals pray to receive Jesus Christ as Savior in those two? So that's pretty cool. That is, such, that is pretty cool. Now, this morning, what I want to do is sort of bring to a, a conclusion the series that we've been in, It's a Wonderful Life Because He Came. And it's a takeoff, obviously, of the, the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And the reason that we picked it is because the truth is, if you look at the three themes of It's a Wonderful Life, all three of those themes are a part of the first Christmas. For instance, this idea, when everything seems hopeless... And there seems to be no way out. Understand this, that it's not hopeless for a follower of Jesus Christ. There is a God on the throne, and he loves us. He knows our need. And though he may respond in a way that may be different than what we've all got mapped out, he will not forsake us. He will stand with us, and he will take us all the way through. It is not hopeless because of Christ. Or the second theme that is a part of it, and that is my life is mattering. Our lives are counting. We are making a difference in the lives of other people, more than we know. We're making a bigger difference in our life, more than we know. But what we talked about a couple of weeks ago is be more intentional 
All of us in our lives, it's the little things. It, it's not just the big events of our life that help us make a difference in somebody else's life. It's the little things, baby little things. And we encounter them like a hundreds every single day, opportunities for acts of love and kindness toward God and toward others. Be watching. Be beco- Become more intentional and deliberate about how we're living our life, and we'll see them. This, just a very small step of kindness toward someone, of graciousness toward someone, of a loving heart toward God and others. How many times over the, this day will you t- just pause and just tell God how much you love Him? There are so many opportunities. Take advantage. And so now this morning, I want us to look at the third idea that comes from It's a Wonderful Life. And it's the best, it's the very best part of the whole movie. It happens at the end of the movie. George Bailey is the key character and he's in trouble. And uh, how does he get his way out of this? And suddenly, People come from all over the town that he is blessed, and they come now to rescue him. They come to his house, and that's where the scene begins. Take a look at this clip. Now, get this. It's from London. Oh. Mr. Gower cabled you need cash. Stop. My office instructed to advance you up to $25,000. Stop. Oh. Hee-haw and Merry Christmas, Sam Wainwright. Oh. in the middle of it, as soon as I got Mary's telegram. Good idea, Ernie, a toast <laughs> to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. <laughs> Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. Atta boy, Clarence. I just love that scene, don't you? Come on, don't you love that scene? Of course you do. This is a great scene. These people that came didn't just bail him out by giving him money. They they affirmed his life. And I will never forget the toast of Harry, his, his brother. There is this toast to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. It's such a cool moment, such a great moment. These individuals gave to him more than money They gave to him a gift that changed his destiny. In two days, between two to three billion people all over the globe are going to pause for a moment and they are going to honor Jesus Christ on Christmas. Because on that first Christmas, Jesus gave humanity an indescribable gift that changed our destiny. Unto us a child is given. Unto us a son is born. The Son of God. Jesus Christ came to be 
the Savior of the world. There is a verse of Scripture that I want you to notice. I love this verse. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, and it simply says this, Thanks be unto God for His indescribable gift. It's obvious that he is talking about Jesus. The, the context of the passage says that. But it is the word indescribable that he uses. It's this, this is the only place in the entire Bible that that one word is used right here in this verse. And it's used by the Apostle Paul, which the Apostle Paul was a brilliant man. He was an intellectual's intellectual, and he had a great handle on the Greek language. But even though he did, and he could have pulled up every kind of Greek word you can imagine as he's trying to describe this gift of Jesus Christ, he's at a loss because no word seems to be good enough. And so he picks the word indescribable. He's so great, he's so amazing that he is an indescribable gift. An indescribable gift is simply a gift that is so incredible, way too awesome and too magnificent for words. The angels tried when they were talking to the shepherds right there, out there in the fields outside of Bethlehem. They tried, and notice what they said in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. It's a great description. But it could be better. I want to tell you, I am one of the world's worst gift wrappers. I've tried. I do. I honestly try to wrap the gift to be really to wrap it as good as I can, I can't do it. I mean, I, I, okay, look at this, look at this. I did not wrap this gift. And I think you know that I didn't. It looks way too nice. When I wrap a gift, very few times anymore do I do it, but when I wrap a gift, it's obvious I wrapped a gift. I tried. I have actually two times taken a gift like this that is wrapped so beautifully I have taken it apart, all the wrapping off very carefully, studied, okay, how did they crease it, what did they do, and then I've tried. And what happens invariably is that I can't get the paper to line up right, and one end's too short, one end's too long, and and then tape is everywhere. And I know you're not supposed to have tape that can be seen. We all know you have to have tape or it wouldn't be held together, but you've got to disguise it somehow so it doesn't look like it has tape. But when I try to make it look like we know it has tape, but it doesn't have tape, it is just a mess. It looks so ragged. And so the greatest invention of all time for Christmas, the greatest Christmas invention, is the gift bag. Is it not the gift bag? Isn't it great, the gift bag? All you got to do is open the bag, put it in, boom, it's done. I know people put frou-frou paper around it. I look at some of these things, it's just flowing out of that bag. So I have tried that, and when I stick it in, it just is, okay, I can disguise. You can't see the, the gift, but it's just paper stuck in is all it looks like. So here is the way you do it, guys. You put it in the gift bag and you staple the top. (laughs) And now it's over. See, it is a great invention. When Jesus Christ was born, Mary took the Son of God and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, in cloth, and laid him in a manger. But God wrapped him even better. And that's what I want to talk to you about. First of all, the baby Jesus came wrapped in the ordinary. One of the things that I've tried to do this Christmas, make a big deal about this this Christmas, is this idea that Jesus did not begin in Bethlehem as a baby, that Jesus already existed, always has existed. He's God in flesh. He's the Son of God. 
And so in heaven, there is Jesus. Before Bethlehem, in heaven, there is Jesus. And he is sitting at the right hand of the throne of his father. And he is there at the throne with all the power and all the glory and all the majesty, all of that. But when the moment came, the key moment in time, when the moment came that God intended Jesus to come, do you see him in your mind's eye? There he is. He stands. Do you see? He's standing now. He's not sitting on his throne anymore. He stands and he lays aside his power. He lays aside his glory. He lays his majesty and his position aside. And he becomes wrapped in human skin, born as a baby in a manger. Honestly, if you and I got together and we were given the job of announcing the coming of Jesus, we were given the job of him coming and us making our big deal about it, it would be in shock and awe, especially if we had no limitation on the funds. He would be coming in shock and awe. It would be like the Olympics opening ceremony. It would be like halftime at the Super Bowl. We would have things going off everywhere. But that is not what God decided to do. One of my favorite authors of all time uh, is Max Licato, and especially with Christmas and with Easter, and I just love to hear. He has unique thoughts that has n- have never come across my mind. And he does about this very thing that Jesus came wrapped in ordinary. The announcement first went to the shepherds. Had the angel gone to theologians, they would have first consulted their commentaries. Had he gone to the elite, they would have looked around to see if anyone was watching. Had he gone to the successful, they would have first looked to their calendars. So, the angels went to the shepherds. Men who didn't have a reputation to protect or an axe to grind or a ladder to climb. Men who didn't know enough to tell God that angels don't sing to sheep and messiahs aren't found sleeping in a feed trough. God comes to the common because his most powerful tools are the simplest. God then adds the extra to use the ordinary in an extraordinary way. Just like God has the ability to do with you and me. He's welcomed you and me into the story of the coming of Jesus Christ. He has welcomed us to be a part of that and then be able to be used by Him to make a difference in the lives of other people around us as we share the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ. He was wrapped in ordinary human flesh and bone, just like you and me. The baby Jesus came wrapped in grace. God's gift to us on that first Christmas was not a recommendation, but a rescue. It wasn't an announcement of yet more things I want you to do but rather a declaration of what God has already done for us. That's why it's called grace. The shepherds came, and in that verse 11 of Luke chapter 2, he says, they said, today a Savior, and this is, this is the key word, today a Savior has been born to you. The biblical concept of second chances is known as grace. The word itself means unmerited favor. It is the idea of receiving a gift for that which we don't deserve. And in fact, we've done so many things to not deserve it. And yet, He has given it to us. It's called grace. Christmas was the time God sent His Son to give us a second chance unmerited favor to give us grace. 
Pastor Juan Carlos, who's our Spanish pastor, told me a story of what had happened in a, an uprising in Colombia in South America. And uh, I went and checked uh, to read more, to get more. It's just an amazing story. In Colombia, there were some really bad dudes, some really bad guys who sort of persuaded and conned thousands of really ordinary guys that didn't have any beef but to join them in the rebellion and arm them with guns, and now they began to terrorize the entire country. But the government in Colombia came to realize that most, the overwhelming majority of these people that were a part of this rebellion were actually good guys who did not really understand the truth and they had been conned into a lie. And they made a decision, an amazing decision. They said that for all of those who are willing to put their guns down and return home, they would be forgiven It will never be brought against them ever the rest of their life. Well, they wanted to communicate this message. And you would think, okay, well, they would get on radio and television and, and by the army they would do it. But they did a very strange thing. I had never heard of this before in my life. They had decided to communicate this forgiveness and grace that they were offering and use an advertising agency, an advertising agency, to study the situation and advise them of how they were to communicate. Well, this advertising agency that they hired, the Colombian government hired, began to study these guys and the villages they came from and all that sort of thing, and they discovered that, that there was a common denominator, and the common denominator was Jesus, that there was this a, a love for God, this love for Christ, and that there was a key moment in this culture in which people's hearts changed, and it was Christmas. I know how crazy this story sounds, but they decided to launch out with an advertising campaign using Christmas to do it to change the rebellion. On the very first one, they called it Operation Christmas. And at nine particular places, they found groves of trees where the, in the jungle where these uh, rebels would cross paths, and they decorated the whole grove, 75-foot-tall trees, with Christmas lights, with a motion detector. I'm really telling you this straight. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? With a motion detector. When these, these rebels would go through, they would hit the motion detector, and all of a sudden, all these Christmas lights would, would come on and Christmas music. And then there was the message, if Christmas can come to the jungle, you can come home. And they told them how to do it. 331 soldiers dropped their guns and left and went home with that. Well, then the next one came, and the next one. And last, or two years ago, they went to all of these villages where these guys were from, and they asked their relatives and families and friend, friends and people in the town, would you write handwritten little notes to the individuals that you know that are part of this rebellion? Would you write them a handwritten note, put candy with it and maybe trinkets or whatever, some uh, jewelry or whatever, something special, and then they were put into these balls that float that have lights in them. Well, look at this picture. They were put into thousands upon thousands and thousands of these lighted balls and put into the waterways that serviced the whole area where the rebellion was taking place. Look at the next picture. That's what it looked like at night, thousands of balls. Well, these rebels started uh, uh, getting these, these balls out of the water and opening up and reading these messages. Please come home. Please, we love you. Do you know what has been offered? They've offered grace to you. You can come home. It's okay. Hundreds upon hundreds of soldiers dropped their guns and went home. Last year was called Operation Bethlehem, and they showed these huge skylights up into the night air, and they had over the loudspeakers, this Christmas, follow the light that will, guard, that will guide you and your family 
at guide you to your family and your freedom. At Christmas, everything is possible. The end result of all of these is over 16,000 men dropped their guns, went back home, and it killed the whole rebellion without anybody being, being killed. Isn't that absolutely amazing? And, and how did it happen? I, who would have ever dreamed of something like this? And how did it happen? Why did it happen? Because Christmas is a time of second chances. It is a time of new beginnings. And I'm here to say to you that God is offering to everyone in this room a second chance, a new beginning And for those in this room that have never come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, you can come to know Him. You can come to know the God that loves you, the God that made you. And for those that have walked away, you can come back. Part of the great power of Christmas is that it's a time of grace, of second chances, of new beginnings. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, says something that is very unusual. We think sometimes that what it is, how a person comes to know God is that they just become better. But that isn't it at all. In fact, grace is the key. Listen to what it says. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by your works, not by all your good deeds, so that no one can boast. Look, I'm smart enough to know that there are many people in this room right now who honestly believe that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. And this is what you've been taught, and this is what you've believed all this time. It just makes sense, doesn't it? And this is why every religion teaches it this way. Muslims and and Buddhists and Hindus and Jews, they all teach it this way. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. But Christianity does not teach it that way. Biblical Christianity actually says it's not good people that go to heaven, it's saved people that go to heaven. And that you and I cannot be saved on the basis of our good deeds. We would never have enough. By the way, not one religion defines, okay, where is the line? How do I know I've got enough good deeds? If it's good people that go to heaven, how good do I have to be? Nobody answers the question. The Bible says to us, there is not one thing you can do. There is not enough good deeds that you can have that can make you go to heaven, that can help you go to heaven because heaven is not something you earn. Heaven is is a gift of grace. You can't earn it. You can never be good enough for it. That's why Jesus is called the Savior. See, if we could save ourselves, we don't need a Savior. If we could be good enough to save ourselves, we don't need a Savior. But because we cannot save ourselves, God had to send a Son to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, to be our Savior. Jesus came wrapped in grace. So listen again to the verse. For it is by grace you've been saved. Through faith, it's not because of you. It is a gift of God. It is not because of your good works so that no one could boast. There is one statement I want you to grab hold of. It is literally life-changing. It is this idea. We don't work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. We don't work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. If we work for our salvation, then every good thing we do, we're trying our best to have enough good deeds that finally God will let us go to heaven. So every good thing we do is a self-serving motive. We're not trying to be nice to other people. We're trying to get God to believe we've got enough good deeds to let us go to heaven. But if we go to heaven by the gift of God, the grace of God, then every good deed we do, we do from our salvation. 
And we do with the motive, oh God, I love you and I want to live for you and I want to honor you and I want to learn how to love other people and I want to learn how to love you more because of what you have done for me. And now it changes from being a self-serving motive to being a God-honoring motive for why we do what we do. You don't work for your salvation. You work from it. And how we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior is through the grace of Almighty God as a gift. There's a passage of Scripture that I'd like us to read out loud together. Don't need you to stand, just sit right where you are. But it's found in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, and it's such a powerful passage. I'd ask you to read it out loud with me, beginning with the word for, and listen as you're reading it to what it's saying. You ready? Here we go. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But he has now revealed him to you in these last days. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. I love the passage because here's what it says. Way before God ever created the the earth, way before God ever created the universe, he had already determined to send his son. Because he could look down through time and he saw us and he knew the choices that we would make. He knew the rebellion that would be in our heart. He knew the salvation that we would need to have that we could not earn ourselves. And so before he even created the universe, he already had determined that his son would come. And it would be by the blood of Jesus that we'd be saved, not by our good deeds. Jesus came wrapped in grace. And you and I come to know Christ as Savior, not by being good, but by responding to the gift. That's the next point. To have God's gift, you have to receive it. I have in my hand a gift certificate. Two papas. Yes, it has money on it. This is good. Yay, God, I've got a gift certificate. Two papas. And no, I'm not giving it away. I'm just using it as an example. (laughs) It's just an example. You know what I read in the New York Post? Here's the statement it made. From the years 2008 to 2014, I don't know what's happened since 2014 to 2018, but from 2008 to 2014, $44 billion of gift cards went unused. Yes, $44 billion. This is why they all want us to buy gift cards. They know we'll forget them or lose them. $44 billion of gift cards went unused. When you get home, you need to go look in your house. You may have a billion or $2 billion worth of gift cards. Someone gave me this gift card. And you know what I did? I took it. Because I'm not dumb. I took it. Of course. And maybe you're going to give gift cards to somebody for Christmas. Maybe you're going to receive gift cards from somebody for Christmas. And how that exchange happens is is they offer it to you and you reach out and take it. So how do we get this indescribable gift wrapped in ordinary and wrapped in grace? How do we get it? Listen to what he says in John 1.12. To all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, God gave the right to be called the children of God. Now listen to me. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10 verse 9. If we confess with our mouth 
that Jesus, you are Lord of my life. The word Lord means boss. Jesus, you are the boss, the Lord of my life. And we believe, he, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. It is not believing in the mind. It's not just a mental ascent. It is believing to the point of commitment. If I, be, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus, I am allowing you to sit on the throne of my heart and be my Lord. And I know, I believe that you rose again from the grave to the point that I commit myself to you. The Bible says you're saved. And this morning, you can come to know the God who loves you, the God who sent the indescribable gift of grace to you, Jesus Christ. You can come to know the God who can change your destiny by coming and giving your heart to Christ and receiving Him as your Savior. And I want to urge you today, would you do it? In just a couple of moments, this service is going to be over. And right through these, these doors right here, and right on the other side of the information center, to the left side, there is a room called the Commons Place. You go to the information center, and they'll direct you. Go to the Commons Place, because we have mem- ministers in our church that are there and waiting, and we'd love to talk with you. How can I come to know Christ as my Savior? You can come to the Commons Place room. And talk to one of our ministers, and we would love to spend the time with you. I want to join this church. I'm visiting Sugar Creek, and I, and I want to, to uh, come and be a member of this church. How do I do it? Go to the Commons Place in just a couple of moments. Right over to the, the Welcome Center, and to the left is that room. And talk to one of our ministers. We would love to talk to you today. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for loving us and sending an indescribable gift, Jesus Christ, your gift of grace to us. We will never be good enough, never can be good enough. But, oh God, we can receive what you offer to us through faith. And then, God, change our life so that those things, those acts of love and kindness that come out of our life don't come from a self-serving motive, but come from a God-honoring motive. For we... Don't work for our salvation. We work from it. God bless, move in hearts today to give their heart to Jesus Christ, to join this church. Whatever you're leading in hearts to do today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.